Nick Majerison here. Welcome to the Top Med Talk Top 10. And this one is Fluid Matters, Part 2, Total Body Water and Electrolytes. This discussion focuses on the Perioperative Quality Initiative's intense focus this year on total body water and electrolytes. It's a fascinating conversation. Have a little listen. Top Med Talk. Hi, I'm Monty Mythen, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, and welcome back to this special edition of Fluid Matters. I'm back here with Henry Howe, medical student from Bristol, one of the regulars on Top Med Talk, and two special guests that I'll introduce in a moment. So to remind you, we're at a perioperative quality initiative at the Washington Duke Inn near Duke University Medical Center in the beautiful North Carolina. And we've been looking at two major areas, uh, one of them related to fluid responsiveness, the capacitance vessels, and we'll come back to that in the second section of this wind-up with regards to what we've learned today. But we're going to go back to the area that myself and Henry were involved with. That was the group discussions about total body water and electrolytes. So, Henry, when we spoke earlier on, the challenge was that at the end of this, we'd have some practical take-home messages, along with all the clever science and physiology that we've discussed that we've really enjoyed, that would make a difference to practice at the bedside. Now, you're a medical student, soon to be a young doctor, be looking after the rest of us in the future. Did did we achieve that? Is there anything useful that's come out of this? Yeah, consensus was definitely reached, and uh, it's nice that... The process went through without any fights or fallouts. And definitely some practical clinical applications will will be followed from this. I don't want to spoil our group's recommendations as of yet because we've got two experts in the field who who will be talking more onto it. But from my perspective, I'm a medical student and from what I was listening, there's a lot of information that I would take home and I will teach other people and influence others. Great. So we're going to walk through the key recommendations. And to be fair, we haven't limited them to the ones we think are truly practical and useful remember again we're talking about total body water and electrolyte balance the context here is the reference point is adult patients undergoing elective major surgery so that would be things like colon surgery for cancer for example so that's our reference point so introduce our two guests here delighted to be joined by tom woodcock and manu malbrain I'll ask them to introduce themselves one by one just briefly. Tom, welcome. Well, I'm Tom Woodcock Senior, uh, because I'm very happy to say that Tom Woodcock Junior was always also here this weekend. Uh, nice to meet my son. Don't meet him up off, off, often enough. And we were both, uh, we were co-authors of a paper in 2012, which our intention was to bring the Starling forces back into fashion and, and into discussion. And I'm happy to say Monty's been sort of following my progress over those long six years. And it's great to come here and be talking about the Starling Forces and our new perspectives on them. Now, Tom, you've relatively recently retired from clinical practice, Mm. but you were in one of our lead organisations in the United Kingdom in the National Health Service. Where Mm. where was that? Uh, Southampton General Hospital. I was there from 1987 to 2015. Fantastic. Well, we we miss you, but we're really pleased that you're still looking after us from the point of view of your educational and research contributions. Manu Malbrain, uh, great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, yes, I'm Manu Mulbrain. I'm internist intensivist. Um, I used to be a bedside clinician, but uh, just recently in October I moved to the University Hospital in Brussels. So what I've been doing the last 20 years is looking at uh, intra pressure and the pathophysiologic implications of uh, increased intra pressure on end organ function. And for the last seven years, I would say I got a special interest in, uh, in fluid therapy with the International uh, Fluid uh, Academy. So I think at least three of the four of us, I don't think Henry's had the privilege yet, to have been to the International Fluid Academy, which has been running for a number of years now. And uh, I, I've been recorded saying this before. I think it is the place to go now to, to meet the people who are interested in this area. Tom, Tom, you've been there. Yeah, I was privileged to be a faculty at Manu's last meeting in Antwerp. And uh, it went very well, apart from, as I said, the traffic getting into town, Manu. That was... <laughs> <laughs> Can't, don't you blame for that. But as you say, uh, a, a, a few hundred very, very enthusiastic delegates, great discussions, top people, well worth visiting. And when's the next one coming up, Manny? So the next one is this year in uh, Amsterdam, the end of November, November 23. So we'll have just a single day mini okay. IFAT, and then we'll have a big IFAT in 2020, and then every second year there will be 
a big one in Belgium and then a small one uh, going abroad. And if people want to look it up, it's the International Fluid Academy, IFAD, and the website is? www.fluidacademy.org. Org. Fluidacademy.org. We'll put a link to that in the uh, in our website so that people can find that. And I know from going to your meetings, you, you have a, a very, I don't know if it's a social media presence, you're a big user of the virtual opportunities as well. I, I think to remember the last one, in one way, shape or form, there were thousands of people not in the room who were engaged. Yes, yeah, true. It's kind of um, a personal experiment. So I I'm exposing myself for the last two years to a social media experiment, trying to find the borders, um, what you can do with uh, with social media. And I sincerely believe that free open access medical education and providing education for students and doctors and residents uh, is extremely important. And it uh, increases the awareness of different topics. And, and um, I think you've had an incredible number of impressions on, would you say millions? Um, Yes, I said millions. In, in the previous Fluid Academy, when I started my social experiment, we had about 5 million impressions after meeting, which I believe was quite a lot. But this year, we had 35 uh, million. 35 million. I so don't know what it means, an impression, but I was just gonna brag it's there and then it's gone. But I was going to brag about the fact I had a few thousand, but I'm not <laughs> going to mention that. Perhaps I feel humbled. Right, so... The key outcomes, the take home from this. So the first one we've talked about is in the monitoring of water balance. Um, there's been a suggestion that patients should be weighed within 24 hours prior to surgery, which we believe is a standard that should be adhered to anyway. But more importantly, that if they're staying in hospital for more than a day afterwards, they should be weighed again. And then each day they still have an IV running, their weight should be recorded. Now, what do we learn from the weight, Tom? Why is the weight relevant? I think this is a really important way of uh, guarding against uh, unrecorded fluid uh, accumulation, either through uh, fluid administration or or failure to excrete uh, fluid, of course. Um, And it seems trite to have to sort of remind people that uh, in this situation, a a kilogram increase in body weight in such a short time is an increase in fluid volume of one litre. Very significant stuff. And we we need to make sure that patients don't become hypovolemic, that is, lose body weight. And we need to make sure that they don't turn into Michelin men, dear I say. You know, I've seen some nice graphics of patients as very swollen Michelin men, and we really have to avoid that. No doubt now that's got to be avoided. Delighted not to see those fluid overloaded patients. So Manny, this familiar territory, does this sound familiar to you? Absolutely. Um, As of my personal bias being the intra-abdominal pressure, we found out that one of the major risk factors for abdominal hypertension is fluid uh, overload. Mm. So I agree that fluid overload, to my Mm. opinion, is is bad medicine. Is it uh, not the aesthetic concern of mm. anasarcoedema, but the organ edema and the venous congestion. Now, uh, one of my other interests has been medical law down the, the years, and one of the worries I have about using the term fluid overload is it implies that the doctor has harmed you. And if we talk, to, we talk about mortality related to fluid overload, we are almost putting the doctors in the dock. Okay, so mo- moving on from that specific choice of the mm. choice of words, the patient gaining significant weight post-operatively the most likely cause is that they've got an accumulation of salt and water it in is. the body, which may or may not have been a necessary part of their treatment, but we should be absolutely doing possible to avoid it. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that doctors have always been trying to give what they see as the optimal amount of fluid. And some, perhaps in years past, what we perceived to be the optimal amount was actually quite a lot. Okay. We had Moore and Shires, as I'm sure you well yeah. know, Monty, who argued about whether we should be compensating for a third space or uh, now it turns out we think we were causing the third space. So, so there is no real third space. There is no gone. third space. So back to practical realities, one of the objections that we're thrown back at us is it's too difficult to weigh patients every day. Mm. I, it, it, the reality in my practice when I was practicing is that it almost never happened. In the intensive care setting, I was often told that it was not practicable to weigh patients every day. In the perioperative setting for less invasively monitored patients, it should be easier, but I do appreciate that on a busy ward with so many other things going on, weight may lose its priority, but it's useful. I'm a bit lost with this. With the modern days of enhanced recovery, where we're trying to get everybody out of bed the following Mm. morning, 
Can't we just put some scales in the loo and ask the patient to weigh themselves and tell us what the number was for most patients? I couldn't agree more, and I used to advocate the idea of putting bathroom scales under each wheel of the intensive care bed, but I was told that that wasn't uh, <laughs> health and safety approved. Okay, so in the, in the intensive care unit, Manu, it is possible to weigh people, isn't it? What we actually do is at least once a week is when we are moving the patient from the bed either to a bedside chair is that we have a special way on the hook when we are replacing uh, the patient. And in our new ICU that we will be building in five years' time, there are rails in the ceiling that may provide this kind of uh, uh, weighing devices. Now I'll get Henry's input in a second to see if there's a practical recommendation. But one of the challenges that we have with the fluids we give, they're isotonic fluids, is we can give inadvertently the patients multiple extra litres, let's Mm. say five litres extra. They'll be now five kilograms heavier. Mm. But when we look at their blood draws, at their serum sodium, for example, it won't give us any clues to that one. And that's the really important thing to note. It doesn't. And this was uh, an issue I raised perhaps rather late in the the session today, that uh, patients under the stress of surgery are capable of, I love the word, desalinating. They can desalinate a a litre of normal saline so that their body water volume goes up by a litre and their their serum sodium can actually drop. Even though you gave them 150 millimoles of sodium, their sodium can drop after administering a litre of saline. It's something we need to be aware of. So we... Well, it's it's a very good point, and that's what we actually discussed, is the different Mm. um, combinations that may be of uh, uh, euvolemia, or maybe it's not a good word, or uh, hypervolemia, hypervolemia combination with low, normal, or increased uh, salt, and and, uh, we need to bring the patients uh, to the middle, which is right, euvolemic and the right amount of salt. So, Henry, is this all valuable now? Have you seen patients being weighed on a regular basis, or...? Uh, as you as you were saying earlier, Tom, um, is it, is very often missed out, and it's 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 sort of left to the bottom of the list on things to do in a, in a lot of settings. So I think it it is very important this protective uh, measurement of weight, so so that we can protect against hypovolemia or hypervolemia. Um, and I so I, I think that's why one of the sort of consensus um, that we brought from our group was that patients should be weighed within twenty four hours prior to surgery. And then daily weight um, recording should continue whilst receiving IV fluids. Is, is that generally? Yeah, absolutely. And then it's making sense of that, putting it in the whole context. So I think we're all agreed that's a, a good idea. Now, the next thing we talked about was the um, circulation of uh, interstitial fluid. So mm. throughout the body, we've got multiple compartments. There's within the blood vessel, there's the bits between the blood vessel and the cells, and there's within mm. the cells. Now, most of the fluid's in the cells. The next biggest compartment is the bit between the vessels and the cells, the Mm. interstitial fluid, and there's the bit in the vessel. Now, the bit in the vessel is where the blood supply that keeps us alive flows, Mm. and within that, there is a filtration of fluid out that Mm. happens on a regular basis. Absolutely, an ongoing basis, and uh, I think that uh, a concept which I've found fascinating recently is that not only does blood circulate, but interstitial fluid circulates as well. There's more than one circulation of fluid going on in the body at any one time. And putting it very uh, briefly, it goes from within the plasma in the vessel, mm. out through the wall, into the space in between, mm. and then from the space in between it gets back in via our lymphatics. It does, and uh, I think that there's been a, an underappreciation of the role of lymphatics for many, many years amongst clinicians. What I learned during the meeting is that um, I used to give hyper-oncotic solutions like uh, hypertonic albumin, 20 or 25%, and with the impression to attract fluids Suck it going back, in. back yeah. reabsorption from the interstitium to the intravascular space. And I think that's a major issue what we learned today, that the filtration may happen from the fluids, but the reabsorption needs to come from the lymphatics or maybe from the different sizes well, of the buckets um, yeah. beyond the... Uh, return of fluid, money rather than reabsorption. Reabsorption is what does yeah. happen. Yes. So, Henry, do you want any clarity on this? I know you were in there for the detailed discussions, but what do you think are some of the key take-home points from that 
area? So for me, I mean, we're taught that the that you have the filtration and the reabsorption, but I didn't know before. Well, Tom Tom brought it to the table that actually this reabsorption just does not happen unless on this um, particular circumstances. And for me, because of that pathway and uh, the emphasis on the lymphatic um, way of getting back in, that's something that we really do need to bring into our clinical. Um, teaching and, and, and the way that we think about how we are f- treating with fluids because it is the most important key role. So now if Henry comes across somebody post-operatively who's got mm-hmm. weight, weight gain and then when they're examined they have evidence of tissue edema, pitting mm-hmm. tissue edema, what, what can he advise can be done to that patient to try and get that fluid via the lymphatics out of those tissues back into the veins to allow the patient to pee out the salt and water. Taking a a view from the top, you have to consider ways in which you can reduce the filtration of fluid from the plasma to the interstitium. And ways of doing that do include increasing the colloid osmotic pressure of the fluid, although the effect of that is very, very small. More importantly is capillary pressure. If you can keep capillary pressure down, that's an important starting force and filtration into the tissue is going to be reduced. How do you do that? In current practice, the way it's most often done, although I think people are doing it without realising they're doing it, is the infusion of a vasoconstrictor like norepinephrine. I'm going to pull you up there for a second, Tom. What I've done now is I've taken... That's very clever stuff for for us. All right. Okay, I'm going to take you. Henry's now out there. First house job. Yeah. Okay, on the ward, on the floor, and he's got the boggy patient, and he's right. trying to make a decision what to do next. I presume the first thing is he's going to back off on his salt and water. If the he's going, going to on. do fluid restriction, absolutely, and he's going to do what he can to encourage lymphatic return, and that may include stockings, that may include ambulation, encouraging the people, patient to get up and walk around the ward. Because lying in bed with your legs up is not going to help. If the patient would be hemodynamically stable, it would still make sense to increase oncotic pressure with, for instance, hypocotic albumin and then followed by diuretics. It's true, man. You can do it that way. It could be done without. Because, you you know, you're privileged to be in a hospital where you have access to albumin. There are hospitals in the world that just don't have it, and that's not available. So it's not an essential way to do it, but it it would contribute. But in the first instance, the fluid, well, it's more the salt. Because one of the things we'll get on to, I think, yeah. is to, get the, to allow the patient to pee the salt out, they are going to need some water. They are. So they're going, if the sodium is of an adequate level, they're going to need some, maybe 5% glucose at a low rate to allow them to keep peeing the salt out. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Yes, I, I wouldn't have sort of been teaching it at that level and in that way but are you, that's a very good point you do need a degree of maintenance mm-hmm. fluid to make up for what you're you're losing and to give you an adequate urine volume and one of the things that we discussed in these last couple of days which i think is a really interesting thing for young doctors and a good habit to get into is to consider how many millimoles, uh, osmoles are, are going into a patient's body how many osmoles are being created and that's the creation of urea which is usually at the rate of six to 700 uh, milliosmoles per day. Not many people realise that. And to do the calculations, because the sick and surgical patient can't excrete more than about, we, we agreed, 600 milliosmoles per litre of urine. If you're only passing a litre and a half of urine a day, you can only get rid of 900 milliosmoles of urea and sodium, and something's got to give, because often you'll be giving more milliosmoles than that. So if the patient's doing reasonably well but is up on their weight and boggy, it should be as simple as managing the fluids. The, the jump to the diuretics is when they're a little bit I, more I, destabilised. By I don't time. doubt that there is a role for diuretics. and I don't doubt that you can achieve uh, a, a reduction of excess uh, body fluids when the, the patient is recovering from his disease with the aid of diuretics, but it, it shouldn't be a necessary intervention. And the first thing to do should be to look at fluid balance properly and to try to mobilise interstitial fluid. If I could just pick on this, the, the fluid balance, because it seems mm. simple, but I guess it's quite difficult for the nurses to obtain a correct fluid balance. There's always the issue of what are we going to do with the insensible losses and how are we going to take in that into account. So that's why I think body weight is, is a better way to do But when it comes to uh, improve the lymphatic uh, uh, return uh, and clearing the excess of interstitial fluids, uh, there are different things we can do. We we could use uh, stockings or to to improve uh, muscular venous contractions. 
or we could look at the back pressure at the venous side, which may directly be related to intra-abdominal uh, pressure. So I believe that venous congestion but is a difficult word, and we didn't mm. agree uh, on the exact term. Um, may be very important, and there are many things that we can do to lower the intraabdominal pressure by improving the compliance of the abdominal wall, by reducing intraluminal contents like prokinetics and things like that, looking for free fluids, and basically uh, intraabdominal hypertension is iatrogenic uh, related to fluid overload uh, in the days before. So I think it's an important message. Any uh, things to clarify about what you can do about the lymphatics? Yeah, th- yeah very interesting. Um, actually, one thing I was thinking of... Um, which was subtly hinted at, was opioid use and reducing that. Does anyone have any comments? Mm. So this hypothetically, Tom, you were saying that opioid use... It is. I introduced the, uh, the, the sort of very basic uh, pharmacologic teaching that I got way back in those dark days of the 70s and 80s that uh, one can screen a candidate molecule for opiate activity by seeing what effect it has on the spontaneous contractility of a rat deferens. Isn't that a wonderful device to use but uh, uh, a lymphatic with uh, spontaneously contracting smooth muscle would similarly find the the, the spontaneous contractility depressed by uh, the presence of an opiate Um, and so one needs to be concerned that if you're using higher dose opiates particularly you may be unnecessarily suppressing the spontaneous contractility of lymphatics but then you're going to say to me, what clinical evidence have you got for that? And I have to say well, that. The, the good news is that we're in the mode of trying to avoid the use of opioids as much as possible. Exactly. Anyway, so Henry's mm. going to be giving mm. multimodal non-opioid analgesia and, and hopefully Absolutely. he can mitigate that possible hypothetical risk just exactly. by doing the right thing. Okay. Manage. Just while we were talking, that brought up the concept of the context-sensitive yeah. yeah. half-life of uh, IV fluids. And I think there are certain conditions, like if you, opiates would be one of them, the other would be uh, induction, anesthesia, hypotension, shock, which will uh, affect the distribution and filtration, probably also an elimination of the fluids, so that the crystalloid and the colloid may behave in a similar fashion, for instance, in a shocked patient, mm. um, as opposed to a patient with uh, preeclampsia and hypertension and increased permeability where the mm. elimination may, may be... Uh, okay, so time's pressing on. So let's rattle through a few of the other things. There's uh, measuring, measurement of body water compartments. We discussed that at some length. And basically the conclusion is that there's nothing that's really ready for prime time. Mm. There's some great ideas out there, and maybe some of the bioimpedance, bioreactance type of methodologies will come to clinical fruition. But as we stand right now, there's nothing we can make a mainstream current recommendation for. So I'm just going to park that one for a second. Uh, The other thing we said was if you're looking at a patient postoperatively who looks as though they have a positive fluid balance, they've gained weight, for example, and they have a low hemoglobin, i.e. it's hovering around the transfusion threshold, you should probably hold fire before you transfuse. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely right. Um, One of the things that uh, emerged through my contemplation of the effects of colloid-containing solutions versus what we call crystalloid, non-colloid-containing solutions, it is that the colloid solutions are particularly capable of making you look anemic. And published clinical experience uh, suggests that patients who receive a lot of colloid solutions are, are more likely to have a lower haemoglobin and then therefore to trigger and to receive unnecessary blood transfusions. And we are not in a position at this stage to say much more than that the uh, prescriber, the treating healthcare team should be aware of haemodilution causing edema, which, if you simply wait, will resolve itself. But the take-home the fluid point, will clear. Exactly. The, the take-home the point for the, yeah, for the young doctor is, but that's with the caveat that they look as though they're uh, fluid positive. Uh, fluid positive. They're doing well. Yeah. The haemoglobin level is adequate. Yeah. And maybe rather than exposing them to a blood transfusion, you just wait for the blood to yeah. thicken up. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. yeah f- fully agree. Of course, in the absence of ongoing uh, bleeding, but putting it around, it's kind of a proof that maybe when you give colloids compared to crystalloids, when you have this dilution, it means that you increase some plasma volume. Mm. So, Henry, happy with that one? Yeah, no, no definitely um, considering hemo- hemodilution uh, is, is important. Mm. 
So the, the last couple of things we're going to deal with very briefly, albumin. So mm. albumin is our sort of reference oncotic pressure molecule. It, it's not actually the principal and only mm. generator of oncotic pressure. It's no. just been our reference point. But it's normal for albumin to drop in a post-operative period. Mm. And that's not necessarily an indication to treat that albumin. That's true. Um, I think that there's an underappreciation of the fact that uh, maybe 40% of our albumin at any one time is within our plasma and circulating in the blood. But 60% of it is in the interstitium and circulating in the interstitial fluid. As I was discussing with someone who questioned me just an hour or so ago, if you're an average albumin molecule uh, in an average healthy person, you will visit the intravascular, the, the bloodstream, maybe twice a day, and you'll visit the interstitium once or twice a day. And when you're stressed, when you're having an operation, all sorts of changes in interstitial fluid volume, in starling forces, mean that the albumin can actually shift from the intravascular to the interstitial space. So Not lost to the body, just spending more time in the interstitial so space. So in the general patient out on the ward, out on the floor, yeah. with successful surgery, there's some degree of albumin leak. There is there's the, some albuminuria as soon as you induce anesthesia. That's, that's an inevitable right. consequence. So if it, it drops is. acutely... Yeah. and the patient's doing well, more likely than not, there's just more of it left the blood vessel than usual. Now, now Manny, you work more in intensive care, and they're sicker patients. There are ways of trying to look at the likely leak ratio. You've got some techniques for that. So. Well, it's just a simple idea. If you have a lot of inflammation, which may cause leak, you may have an increased CRP, serum CRP value. And if there is a leak, there will be this drop in albumin. So if you do the ratio between the CRP divided by the albumin, and you follow this sequentially in patients, you will see that it's kind of peaking on day three and then will come down. And in those who are doing poor, it will remain at a higher level. So it may be an indicator of uh, poor source control and, and ongoing uh, inflammation and leaking. So, so this leakiness, is a, albumin is a, a, me, a way of measuring leakiness? Is that, is that what we're saying? Yes. Well, one, another, my little bugbears is that we throw around the term leakiness quite fast. And sometimes mm. what we actually mean is an increased conductivity of water leaving the circulation. Sometimes what we mean is an increased rate of molecules like albumin leaving the circulation. They're not actually the same thing, although I'm afraid we tend to talk generally about leakiness and I'd like to see people concentrating a little bit more on what they mean by leakiness investigating a bit more what happens to leaky capillaries but in sick patients indeed it has been nicely described in, in burn patients where you have an ideal model if you go over 25 percent total uh, body surface burned area you get a systemic uh, inflammation and it was shown that in the urine after burn injury you can see that there is a leak of albumin so if you look in the urine at the albumin over creatinine ratio you see that it's increased and then after 8 to 12 hours mm -hmm. it comes back to normal which is our concept that uh, initially we didn't give colloids to burns in the first 12 to 24 hours maybe because Great of stuff. so for many of your patients well you know try and look at the albumin beforehand and the acute drop in the patient is otherwise doing well is probably redistribution and it will probably come back again now some patients are going to have nutritional issues that's a separate problem look at one of our earlier pokies for that that's been published uh, relatively recently so last two points very quickly mm -hmm. sodium balance and a little bit about chloride now we, disc we discussed the proteins, albumin, colloid osmotic pressure, and the rate of, of fluid escaping from the blood vessels. But actually, for most of the body, from the point of view of the fluid moving around, sodium is the big player. It is. Sodium and the osmolality of the, the body fluids is a major determinant of distribution between intracellular and extracellular fluids. So if I ingest a whole load of salt over mm. time and somehow get my serum sodium to go up, I'm at risk mm. of blood being drawn from my cells? Into when we're looking at the long-term regulation of, for instance, blood volume and interstitial fluid volume, then dietary sodium and renal function are really important. Eat too much sodium, you will become hypertensive. You will soak up all your sodium binding sites with sodium. So looking at, again, out on the general floor in the post-operative patient, there's, you know, most sodiums are roughly normal. Mm. But sometimes they go up and sometimes they go down. Mm. Now, the, the low sodium, the major consequence of that, if it goes too low, is what? 
Uh, the problem with dropping the sodium and so dropping the extracellular fluid tonicity is that you get a reciprocal increase, uh, volume for volume, a reciprocal Cellular increase edema. in the yeah in Cellular the, in the cellular fluid. And what cerebral edema is mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. can do the greatest harm. And I, I wonder whether we underappreciate the fact that many of our post-operative patients swell their brains a bit. Could this be related to confusion? Could this be related to dysfunction? Vice versa, if we remove fluids too much, this yeah. may cause hypernatremia and cellular mm. dehydration. So, And this may be a link to cognitive dysfunction that was yeah. shown so, yeah. So in hyponatremia, we have this consequence of the cell swelling. And then in hypernatremia, mm. we have a relative lack of water. Is that the general? And, and the cells can shrink. shrink. Yeah. So, right, so if you see the patient whose sodium has been dropping, the most likely cause of that postoperatively is the fact that they've got disproportionately more water going in than salt. Mm. And it's usually us that have done that to them where, with our intravenous mm. fluid regimens being a bit light on salt. So that's what you need to watch because if it keeps going down, they can fit. Mm. And there's been very unpleasant reports of children, for example, dying mm. as a result of this phenomenon. That There are some pathological conditions that we should just touch on in passing that relates to abnormal handling in the kidneys. But normally it's the simple things, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, you need to look at, for instance, it's something as simple as the patient's drug history. I mean, people who are taking non anti-inflammatories long-term are much more prone to hyponatremia than others. Older patients are much more prone to hyponatremia. And women who are menstruating are very prone to fluid overload and hyponatremia. So it's worth keeping an eye on. And again, don't react too much if it's subtle changes, but look at the fluid balance, etc. Now, perhaps the one that's not necessarily treated as effectively is when the sodium's creeping up. Mm. And what's the most likely cause of that post-operatively, Manny? Well, if the sodium's creeping up in a general patient, is it as simple as a relative lack of water for most of them? Well, it could be, could be many things, but also there I think it's iatrogenic because we've given too much soul to the patient, and uh, that may be the, the main message that we should avoid not only water overload but also sodium overload and look at the total sodium balance. And, Henry, we showed you this diagram that, that, that's been worked up which emphasizes the fact that a patient can be have a very excess. They can be that five kilograms heavier. Their sodium can be 155, for argument's sake. So they can actually be thirsty. And although it sounds crazy, what they need is some water without salt in it to get that out. Does that make sense? Yeah, looking at the, the diagram, I think it's got the volume and the tonicity. And it'll be really interesting to have a look at it once the paper's published because it will show different ways in which you can bring back to the central normal just right sort of yeah. homeostasis and we should remind ourselves when that comes out is that if you're going to give water to rehydrate the cells you do need some sugar because there's a so-called co-transporter at a cellular level which is why the who rehydration solutions mm-hmm. over years have always had some sugar in it we don't have time for mm-hmm. that at the moment final one chloride it's good old normal saline has a high concentration of chloride in it yeah. I don't like to go with the flow, do I, Monty? And, uh, <laughs> but we've recommended I've, it should be measured. I, we have, well, I think that was my problem. Ever since I've been in intensive care medicine, I have been very aware of the dangers of hyperchloremia, and I absolutely insisted when I became a consultant in Southampton that the intensive care unit patients would have their chlorides done with every electrolyte analysis. So just to remind ourselves of the challenge, n- normal saline, which is a very common mm. isotonic solution, contains 154 millimoles per litre of sodium, yeah. which is a little bit elevated, and 154 yeah. millimoles that of sounds chloride. sounds ab- abnormal, doesn't it's, it? It's, it's 154 of chloride. Because it's normally about 100, your serum chlor- chloride. Absolutely. So, so it's well, a, well, we're talking about chemical normality, <laughs> and uh, you, it's, very, <laughs> yeah. it's very amusing, and I've hold, heard that joke a thousand and one times. But, but it will, if you do that, the chloride will go up in a dose-dependent fashion. It will. That's the language you gave us now. I think we're clear now that that can be clinically relevant. And I don't disagree with that for a moment. But if you are measuring your patient's electrolytes every day and if you are watching where the chloride's going, you can intervene when it starts to rise and you can do something about uh, it. Why not just not cause it in the yeah. first place? Don't give saline. Because if you're not, uh, uh, what, and stop measuring chloride. The, 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 the big reason that, uh, well, 
First, of all, there are many points I would say in defence of sodium chloride. And wouldn't it be great to have a pro-con debate and see whether we can persuade an audience? I think that would be, yeah, almost would be fun. I think, I think this one. I would dead. point out that sodium chloride solutions have saved many more lives than almost any other drug I can think. But would of. they save more than Hartman solution? That's a difficult argument. If you talk to the neurosurgeons, they will tell you that it kills oh, patients well, with brain injuries. We accept that, yeah. that subset. So we're going to agree. We're going to agree to disagree. On this and subset. I have seen a woman <laughs> die after gynaecology surgery. Surgery of hyponatremia in spite of Hartman's solution. We've we got to wrap this. So, so we, we agree to disagree, but let's go back to the practical point from for Henry's perspective. Yeah. Is if the, their patient is doing less well, yeah. and postoperatively a blood gas is drawn quite appropriately as part of the evaluation, mm-hmm. and on that there's a metabolic acidosis, there's a chance that this metabolic acidosis could be iatrogenic from the solutions is that is that a key bit in non respiratory you would say non respiratory yeah, yeah, yeah respiratory yeah. Yes, metabolic yes, yes, or yes, non respiratory yes. yeah Absolutely. no you're absolutely right and even in my own practice i would often find after 3 or 4 liters of uh, sodium chloride infusion in a patient in theater for a few hours that the chloride would be a little high and what i used to do was to give that patient a little bit of sodium bicarbonate before he or she got back to the intensive care unit so there'd be no panic about the metabolic acidosis that the patient would I think the message for, for the medical student would be if you look at the base deficit it would, it would be minus 10 and you see yeah. that there is an increase in chloride that they at least should consider that chloride if all the rest is normal yeah. may be the cause of the met- metabolic or non-respiratory So I acidosis. say look at, look at uh, once you've looked at the base excess look at five other things look at the lactate which is usually on the gas look at the sodium and the chloride which is, should be commonly available uh, see if the urine's been dipsticked. Look at see if there's ketones in the urine. That get the blood glucose, which is usually on the blood gas, and look at the urinary pH. So if all the other things are normal and the chloride is elevated proportional to the sodium, yeah. and it's of a magnitude of elevation that equals the base, uh, de- the delta base, then it's the chloride that caused the problem. Yeah, and one of the things that Henry, as an intelligent medical student, is going to notice and ask is that when you see the lactate rising, Professor Mythen, you often recommend fluid. Why do you recommend a lactate-containing solution in order to bring down a rising plasma lactate? That's a longer conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Well, now we're talking about chlorine, and I can't answer that question. (laughs) But we're under pressure to let the other group come and join us. So on a very positive note, Henry, any final takeaway messages? Yeah, no, it's been a a gruelling but very productive last two days and very enjoyable, and I'm looking forward to the paper that's published right? and and in the group we've had you medical student we've had uh, more junior doctors we've had nurses with us is it important when we do these things that we have the reality check of having the real workers in the room with us absolutely because in the, in the end of the day it's going to be the sort of junior doctor nurse who's going to be administering the fluids and, and and bringing the um and treating so we do need to make sure it's understandable everything that's going on here that, that people can pick it up and then and so, then so, so manny good to have the medical students with us Absolutely agree. And I would like them to go home with the knowledge that fluids are drugs and we should look at them as any other medication. So it's about Mm. the drug, the dose, duration and the escalation when they're no longer needed. Tom, thanks very much indeed for coming. It's been brilliant. Great to have Tom Jr. here as well. I'm sorry we didn't have enough headphones to get him involved. Travel, travel safely. Thank you very much. Top Med Talk. Don't forget, of course, you can meet the Top Med Talk team. All you need to do is go to ebpom.org forward slash meetings. There you'll find out all of the meetings that we'll be in attendance at. We've got some great stuff coming up here on Top Med Talk. Make sure you sign up to the email mailing list as well. Absolutely crucial, really, because once you're on board with the email mailing list, we can then contact you and tell you when we're streaming live from the website, from one of the many conferences we're in attendance at. And we can also keep you up to date as to how you can meet the Top Med Talk team. So email Get on there. Get on the email mailing list, topmedtalk.com. That's topmedtalk.com.